welcome everybody. Um, and thank you for hanging out with us this late into the summer. So much appreciated. Um, I'm not a specialist in international relations or in Middle East studies, but I keep up in a general way and have never read an IR book like Catherine Charette's. In digging deeply into a turning point in the Israel-Palestine conflict, Dr. Charette treats this international crisis as in part a saga of the affective lives of people with authority who are unable or unwilling to confront themselves while seeking the results that they say they want. As you will hear, the book is based on extensive field work that they conducted with participants in the 2006 Palestinian legislative elections and with the European Union officials who formed policy in reaction to it. In asking why these elections led to such a negative path for diplomacy, peace, Gaza, and Palestinians, why the EU that is seems to have gotten it so wrong, Dr. Charette discovers that the EU officials don't really like the policies that they forced onto the situation. This leads to nuanced explorations of the role of fear and foreclosure in the diplomatic world and of the distressing appeal of the psychological state summarizable as we had no choice, no choice but to adopt a position whose problems we clearly saw. Uh, the book taught me about the 2006 election on which I had not focused before and also helped me ponder the frequency with which we accept the unacceptable because we or others enact this state of mind, we have no choice, but don't we? Dr. Charette is proposing that a better grasp of the aesthetic, psychological, and performative aspects of international relations will not only increase our understanding of them, but also perhaps improve their outcomes. Their book has a kind of directness that gave me a sense of openings that I don't usually have when thinking about this topic. Um, so this is a long way of saying to Dr. Charette and to her respondents that I'm very pleased you're all here helping the foundation launch this book. Um, a word about the context for this launch. ISRF fellows have been doing more than their part to address the intersecting crises that afflict the world today. Since we started our series last November, we've launched three books on the need for the democratization of society. Adeline de Dang on freedom, Oche Anazi on Ubuntu as an African path toward disability justice, and Kimberly Brownlee on the philosophical priority of social rights to individual rights. We've launched two books on the failure of prominent efforts to suppress war, Keanu Driscoll on the failings of just war theory, and Craig Jones on the war lawyering that makes continuous war more, not less likely, in the American and Israeli armed forces. So Dr. Charette's book on the Hamas election is the third of these. We've also launched two books on how mainstream economics damages both society and the planet as directed in anti-democratic modes by specific interests. There was Gabor Schering's book on Hungarian leader Viktor Orban's creation of an accumulative state. And in June, Peter Newell's book on breaking the grip of the fossil fuel complex over energy policy so that there can be a complete power shift in his term toward renewables. This week in the outside world, events have linked these same elements of limited democracy, climate, and war. The international news on Monday was of a US airstrike on facilities used by militias on the border between Syria and Iraq. Monday was also the day much of Western Canada and the US saw their highest ground temperatures in recorded history, where they hit 46.6 degrees Celsius in Portland, Oregon, and 42.2 degrees Celsius in Seattle, Washington, and at one point, nearly 50 degrees Celsius in British Columbia. Many people have seen the video of a Canadian bear entering someone's backyard so her cubs could have a swim in the pool but the heat breeds terror as our own actions create a climate that makes war on us on the same day that one nation's main international intervention in the Middle East was not for a power shift around energy on cli uh, in climate, but on an act of war. Catherine Charette's book is about paths other than these, of paths not taken, of desires for peace and reconstruction that we are unable to fulfill, but that nonetheless are already present in our own minds waiting for us to conjure them together. Okay, so as Lars mentioned, we'll hear from Dr. Charette first, 
coming to us from South London, I believe, and then from three particularly interesting experts on the field. First from Majid Abdusalama, who I thought was in Berlin, but may in fact be in Switzerland at this point. Uh, from Professor Richard Falk, who is on the Bodrum Peninsula in Turkey, and from Rhys McCauld in Glasgow, Scotland. So I will introduce these just before they each speak, which brings me to Catherine Charette. Uh, they're a former ISRF fellow who took their BA at the University of British Columbia and their PhD in international politics at Aberystwyth University and is currently uh, teaching at the University of Westminster in London while conducting research in Palestinian politics, imperialism, queer theory, performativity, and technopolitics. In addition to the other information that you've seen on the slide at the top, I'll only add a couple of references to some of the better titles in the discipline of international politics, thanks to Catherine. The Wheel That Lost Its Chair, or How They Came to Bomb Palestine, Diplomacy in Drag and Queer Eye Art, Art, Reflections on the Performance, Sipping Toffee with Hamas in Brussels. Catherine, it's really a pleasure to turn it over to you. To, to begin by thanking the ISRF, um, who do so much to support radically interdisciplinary work, and thank them in particular for supporting me, um, which they've done enormously since I was an early career research fellow with them. And I'd also like to, of course, thank uh, my discussants for uh, reading and offering the remarks on my book today. Thank you, Majid, Richard, and Reese. So I had the privilege of speaking with Isla Jad yesterday morning, the head of the Institute for Women's Studies at Birzeit University in Ramallah in occupied Palestine. I'm not sure if Isla will join us today, Many of you know that Palestinians have been protesting against the Palestinian Authority, henceforth PA, for the torture and killing of Nizar Banat, an activist and critic of the Fatah-dominated PA and Palestinian security forces. Isla Jad explained that she has been busy with the Women's Union in Palestine to organize a general strike in protest of the Palestinian Authority, the current governing body in Palestine, for their ongoing violence, corruption, and ineffectual leadership in front of the Israeli-led occupation. I cannot think of a better excuse for not attending my book launch. Moreover, Isla offered generous remarks in the book, which she, said, which she said analyzes how Europeans have played a significant role in distorting the political landscape in Palestine through their support for Fatah against Hamas. She also said that the book accounts for variations in the European Union, European Union representative's response, as in different actors within the Euro European Union feel differently towards uh, their own boycott of the Hamas government after Hamas won the elections in 2006. Isla's comments get to what is the heart of the text. How do actors perform a diplomatic position that they fundamentally disagree with? So two years after Hamas's success in the 2006 Palestinian legislative elections is when I first began uh, research on this topic in 2008. And in my work at an institute in Barcelona, I couldn't find a single diplomat, single European Israeli uh, diplomat that agreed with the sanctions of Hamas and agreed with the sanctions on the Palestinian voters for voting for Hamas. None thought that it was a good idea those that attempted to argue for the sanction of Hamas, uh, those arguments were poorly construed and essentially irrational. So the book, uh, the book's starting point, and I'm not uh, ashamed to say, is a kind of hopeful naivety. Um, and it performs this, this feeling that took Europe diplomats uh, at face value, at their own word. So, for example, uh, Edward McMillan Scott, who was the head of the European Parliament at the time of the elections, says that the elections uh, were a model for the, for the region. They were transparent, they were fair, they were free. Uh, EU uh, documents um, that they released after monitoring the elections said that these elections, which Hamas won, were an essential step in state building uh, for Palestinians at the time. And the book also takes uh, Hamas's own earnest participation in these elections as a sign of uh, transform as transformation. So as uh, Hamas had previously boycotted all other elections, 
um, apart from union elections, um, regarding elections as a uh, result of the unjust Oslo Accords. But in 2006, right, they decide to participate in, the, in these elections. Um, so they put together a really meticulous um, uh, electoral platform. Uh, they launch a, um, an electoral platform that is progressive, inclusive. It talks about freedom of the press. It talks about women's rights. And uh, they essentially do a really good job uh, in launching these elections, and they win, right? They win the majority of the seats in parliament, a result um, that the EU were not expecting, um, hoping that, in fact, Fatah, their uh, preferred party, were going to win these elections. So the book, and in fact, each chapter of the book, traces what is essentially the fading of hope. Both of myself and my interviewees, as uh, there's a fall into despair as the hope of these elections begins to dismantle around everyone. Ghazi Ahmed, a former advisor to Hamas, the, uh, Hamas's elected prime minister, Haniya, explained to me in an interview, I expected them, the EU, to deal with us normally as an elected government. This would have encouraged us to move forward, to make changes but instead they put us in a cage. Ghazi Ahmed, along with Ahmed Yosef, encouraged their brothers within the Hamas movement um, to participate in these elections and to maintain an open door policy for all EU leaders, uh, which was treated with disdain. At the same time, right, there's a lot of excitement and, and, uh, and energies around these elections. Rosemary Hollis, particularly also from the NGO community, civil society community, all of the election observers who traveled to Palestine to observe these elections. Um, Rosemary Hollis, director of research at Chatham House, who was in Egypt at the time of the elections, she, soon as she hears the results, she tells me that she travels uh, to Palestine, uh, eager to invite Hamas leaders to come to Europe, but she's told, don't, don't bother, don't risk it. Hamas leaders will not be allowed into Europe. Uh, they will not be allowed off the plane uh, when they arrive. And this is exactly what happened, right? Bassam Naim, Minister of Health, arrives into Europe uh, in order to hold diplomatic conversations with European leaders. Um, and he is uh, told uh, while sitting on the tarmac that he is not allowed in and that he will be refused and sent back to Gaza, which is exactly what happened to him uh, twice. So instead of talks, the EU enact a series of cruel and punishing policies, such as refusing to pay, now cruel and uh, policies, refusing to pay the salary of any civil servant that will work in the Hamas government. They still at home today receive their salaries for refusing to work with the Hamas government. Um, so, and they divert all funds towards uh, Fatah, trying to circumnavigate any, and, and these policies are still in place today, right? Circumnavigate any part of the government controlled by Hamas. Hamas, a resistant movement turned government, uh, fills uh, senior positions within civil society um, and, and manages to, to, to pull together a government which uh, does effectively rule since then. So the book is very much a story of disappointment, right? And it draws on a range of unsuspecting texts to accompany my interviews with Hamas leaders and EU bureaucrats and my ethnographic research in Brussels and Gaza. I draw on, Arthur, I draw on a range of texts such as Arthur Miller's 1949 play, A Death of a Salesman, to account for the pressures of a belief system such as capitalism and bureaucracy whereby civil servants, including very senior civil servants, right, such as the Secretary General of NATO, Javier Solana, who at the time was the senior EU foreign policy chief, he performs a belief that he will lose his job if he doesn't obey orders, doesn't enact the decisions of his superiors, right? So technocrats are ignored, people with a, a, um, a knowledge of on the ground uh, how these things play out, uh, perform a belief that they will lose their job if they don't offer their opinions uh, to their higher ups. Both uh, Miller's 1949 play and the boycott of Gaza end in death. I draw on Toni Morrison's literary critique of Ernest Hemingway's novel to allow me to describe the racist structures of the European Union, um, which means that I argue they completely miss reality. They perform a script of the racialized other, which allows them to perform a fantasy of European superiority, 
meaning that they essentially miss all of the concessions that Hamas is performing at the time. So Hamas is offering a national unity government after the elections, which it, dis it, it removes any people that others might consider to be hardliners. It fills the government with technocrats and independent leaders. It's offering all of these concessions. And meanwhile, Europeans are saying they don't know how to compromise. They don't understand democracy. I turn to the cultural theory of Sarah Ahmed's text, Queer Phenomenology, uh, to account for the way that institutions are organized in a way that orients those who belong to these institutions to continue with the same policies and practices over and over and over again, uh, despite uh, their ineffectual results, right? Which means uh, putting together uh, resolution after resolution, even though these resolutions uh, cannot be implemented. I look at John McKenzie's text, Perform or Else, to account for the pressures that these institutions face, where it becomes more important to perform the rituals of an institution, such as getting things done quickly. And I think we can all sort of uh, relate to these things, right? So trying to get things done quickly, um, trying to keep the institution together rather than performing what we think is correct or good, right? There's a fear within these institutions that Chris talked about earlier, um, that if we do not maintain the institution, uh, we will be fired, we will be made redundant. Um, so there's a, a work and cultural pressures um, that, that force us to work in a particular way, that if you step out of line um, or you do something uh, that is out of the norm, uh, you will get kicked off stage as it were. So we've all become really good at behaving correctly. So um, this sort of answers the question of how do you get people to do things that they would otherwise not do? Um, and the book is very much, it is much interested in exploring these pressures as it is for exploring ways to get out of these pressures. And the book very much turns to uh, performance art um, and literary texts in order to explore these ways to push back against these pressures, right? To perform uh, at the limits of these performances. So what are the ways in which we, and I'm gonna to try to, to conclude here because I don't wanna go on too, too long. Um, the book, uh, what are the ways in which we can kind of push back against these boundaries of, of performance and look for ways uh, to change our daily practices? Um, so one of the ways that I look at is the importance of storytelling and how the way in which we tell stories uh, holds different people to account for their actions, right? The book is written in a performative way um, in order to disrupt the way that Palestinian politics is usually written about uh, within the halls of the European Union. Um, that refuse to mention the word colonialism, refuse to offer context to these issues. The book instead describes the stillness before the next Israeli bomb is dropped while Majid and I, Majid's father and I, enjoy our morning coffee and cardamom together it describes the sounds of singers chanting in suffering and in celebration of the 1,027 prisoners were rele released from Israeli jails, some of whom released after 24 years of being held unjustly. These are stories that cannot be captured in arguments nor resolutions. I turn to the stories of those who have struggled against oppression, for they tell us how to hold power to account. The book turns to Black and transgender performers in Harlem to learn and share their stories of survival and struggle. The book repeats the pointed question of Sinn Féin leader Pat Sheehan to a representative of UNRWA, Palestine, after, two, after the 2012 bombing of Gaza. Pat Sheehan, Sinn Féin leader, asks uh, UNRWA representative Scott Anderson, why did the UN not make a political statement during the most recent bombardment of Gaza? Why did you not personally release a statement that, that says Israeli is targeting civilians and it's wrong? Fanon reminds us in his anti-colonial writing that form matters, side stories matter. In this book, I tell side stories as a way of making evident the, daily, uh, the pressures of daily institutional and cultural rituals that prevent us from actually seeing what's going on. There's a part in the book where I describe a conversation between myself and my mother. It goes like this. Catherine, it's late. I think we should go to bed. Mom, she keeps talking. Catherine, I think we should go to bed. It's late and you need your rest. 
Mom looks disappointed. Catherine insists. People who are about to die don't want to sleep. Mrs. Dalloway, always throwing parties to cover the silence. The book interrogates the rituals that structure daily cultural and institutional life. And it asks how these rituals prevent people from hearing and seeing important clues. It turns to performance art and literature in order to present how these rituals can be form performed differently. And it asks us to be moved in different ways. There have been no elections in Palestine since 2006, the event described in my book and the talk today. The most recent elections were supposed to be held this year, were canceled by Mahmoud Abbas, the leader of the opposition to Hamas. The decision to sanction Hamas after its, 2000, after its success in the 2006 elections ushered in a climate in which Hamas and the Palestinian people have been collectively punished. The EU enacted a policy, policy decision that imposed conditions on Hamas that were actually impossible to achieve. There were no benchmarks for good behavior and the no contact policy meant that Hamas and the EU uh, could not in, engage with each other to see if there were progress on the, on the conditions imposed on Hamas. Europeans hold, have tried to hold up an idea that Hamas are terrorists because without this, Europeans are exposed to their own ignorance at best and at worst cruelty, both then and now. Thank you. We have three respondents. They're each going to speak for approximately five minutes. Catherine is going to come back uh, with a quick response, and then we are going to open it up for questions and just a general free for all with the panel. So. Please feel free to load up the, the Q&A box with questions, which will be passed on to the speakers. Um, there's one comment quite interesting already in there. So help yourselves to that. Um, all right, Majid Abu Salama is currently writing a doctoral dissertation at Tampere University in Finland. Uh, is born and raised in a Jabla refugee camp in Gaza. He has worked for many years as an independent journalist where his work made him a finalist for the Mediterranean Journalist Award and a winner of the Freedom of Expression Award in 2011 for writing on human rights and social justice in Palestine. He is a political organizer with the Human Rights Coalition Palestine Speaks, is on the board of We Are Not Numbers website and is co-founder of the Palestine Speaks Coalition in Germany. His writing appears at Mondeweiss and other places. And there he is. I just uh, first uh, thank you, Catherine. It was very deep and um, and uh, very like uh, diverse uh, introductions that brings us very close to where um, this book actually was uh, uh, bringing a very deep um, uh, reality to where have we been a couple of years ago? Me and you in the streets of Gaza, walking, drinking coffee with my fathers, having the bomb falling, running from place to place to actually survive what's happening while asking the questions, you know, uh, Hamas, uh, the EU, meeting all those people together uh to to ask where where is the who failed who and who what is the disasters and all that uh first i'm very happy and congratulate you for congratulate you a lot for your great work and this amazing book that uh, looks like a novel it's very easy to read and it's very beautiful to see how you actually develop to uh, that I feel that there is a palestinian who wrote the book which is a very good um sign because i was uh amazed at how you managed to put a lot of line from Fanon to Judith Butler to some queer theories to uh, bringing lots of uh, whiteness and critical um, way of looking at uh, how we as Palestinians want to map every steps of our lives uh, especially when it comes to um, to the book uh, I do think you managed to expose the elephant in the room very well and uh, I am very um, happy to see that in the end of the day, um, I lived myself as uh, any as Majid with my family. I was very, I was uh, 19 years old when Hamas came in or 18. And it's very, um, it's very, was interesting to me to see that democracy that, uh, that, uh, that comes from us, you know, that doesn't fit the European uh, mentality 
it's con considered a mistake or a disaster or a failure that does uh, not at all brings any just uh, to us. And whatever we do that doesn't fit them, doesn't fit their liberalism, doesn't doesn't fit their uh, how they see realism and uh, liberalism. It's uh, always uh, it's always a, a stage that doesn't fit the, like doesn't um, makes us <laughs> good people. Uh, and that is where you explain that um, you and you investigate uh, clearly about how how it could uh, have been, have gone otherwise, you know. And that's a question, you know. It, would not uh, go otherwise anywhere except if they accept us accept us as the same as i always uh, when i speak uh, and diff to different parliamentarians especially those committees a friend of palestine friend of palestine israel and the different parliaments say i always feel when they ask me about hamas they always want me to tell them they are the bad people because they expect that i come from a leftist family uh, it and uh, that cold or uh, what they want to put me, they want to frame me as the good person. So, you know, the good person is me. I had this guy's leftist, he's uh, he comes from secular families, he is so he's a good guy for sure. He's against those uh, bad guys who are the Hamas people. Then they expect, then they 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 come with this, like they uh, they come with this factor that they expect me to answer that yeah you're right but then I would say no they are the legitimate representative of our people and I as Palestinians were active in the political movement in Gaza I always felt that they have not been given the chance to represent uh, Palestinians and always they have been in that place where they the, the strategical uh, interest which you mentioned of the West doesn't actually come uh, at all with the interest of the Palestinians because the West still see the good guys as Fatah, especially those social democrats who want to sustain those who they think as close to them and they still want to give uh, the other, uh, they don't want to give the benefit of the doubt to, the, to Hamas in any way. And they want to just uh, bring, they, they, it's, they found it as the, um, the, the, the the ones that they could uh, embed and frame the framework of uh, like terror and uh, like war and terror on them. And that's where I'm uh, very much uh, become a target myself, you know, uh, become the terrorist myself as I would, uh, as, as Ham any things were under Hamas legitimate uh, control you know, become a target where me and my family and everybody who come and visit and anybody around become a target. And this collective punishment, according to international law, is actually uh, for, uh, prohibited and have been uh, for many years uh, uh, the human rights councils and other uh, organizations have been saying clearly that uh, this is not, um, this is... Uh, this is prohibited, this is against international law, this is against uh, violation, but that doesn't actually constitute well with the, with the Western politicians who uh, know everything, know everything, they know, they know Hamas, but they don't want to discuss with them. They come with, as, uh, as Catherine say, they come with a question and answer, but they actually know the answer. They don't want to listen to them and actually uh, have them uh, included in the discussion that the Palestinians want because what they what they uh, what they started when they started the meeting what they end is to sanction Hamas and by sanctioning Hamas they want to sanction all the Palestinians while they don't want to realize that Hamas also is the one of the most legitimate uh, representations of Palestine of Palestine uh, in inside uh, inside Palestine and outside Palestine. And why I'm saying that, because if you look at the parties in Palestine, it's very important to realize that Hamas is the most well-structured party. It's a liberation movement that have been fighting, but it, they don't want to see Hamas as a liberation movement, as a resistance movement that is actually anti-colonial. Actually, they want to just frame them in the framework that satisfy them to still keep them in this target framework where they... Exclude them, exclude them, reduce them, and that by exclude them, excluding them, and reducing them, it's to reduce the rest of the people who are actually living under uh, the government of Hamas, including me, my family, and my community, who has been for the last fifteen years under 
this uh, very brutal blockade by Israel because of the same things that is also and by the EU also because I see the blockade actually an, an extended reality of the EU sanction and and this continuous farce that uh, EU have actually created to find to uh, distinguish from the beginning of uh, distinguished from the beginning the good guy and the good guy and the bad guys have actually uh, not come to any uh, like to any to have to be corrected or actually to come to the Palestinian and say we are sorry you know we want to change this reality however they have left us alone fighting the Israeli the increasing Israeli attacks against us against us where we increasingly become a target where Hamas become uh, more and more actually legitimate in our community as they are the only one who is giving the Palestinians dignity and they are the only ones who are fighting uh, the colonial power of, um, of, uh, of Israel. That is, uh, that is uh, actually not uh, which that dignity that the EU and other, pa other factors that put money and aid and all this uh, to add to the other good guys, as they say, uh, have never have never bring any dignity to the Palestinians. And we see that during the last attacks in uh, on Gaza, how Hamas actually became very popular among the Palestinians because they have managed to uh, create a scene that is more legitimate more every time more legitimate than any time and also they have uh, they are as a party very well structured very uh, good they have good administration they reach out to the people to the vulnerable to they are they are everywhere they have their institution they while other parties actually non existence you can say or part of ngos or so on that is not functioning Realizing that Hamas, as uh, Catherine said, uh, is is the legitimate uh, is being legitimate for a while and is is still getting more legitimacy from the people and the agency, the national agency for the struggle for Palestinian at the moment, uh, maybe should uh, define the new future that Palestinians want, which is the future that where Hamas is, can just mu and must be accepted so we can go forward because uh, going forward would not um, be uh, would not um, would not be at the price of excluding Hamas it going forward would always have to include Hamas as the front line of our uh, uh, like uh, legitimate uh, representation of Palestinians as we see at the moment actually in all of Palestine and outside of Palestine. Therefore, I invite uh, uh, the people actually to listen to write to read Catherine's book actually and uh, allow us to very much go deeper to this very uh, interesting realities where she comes to just actually see the white person really well, you know, and how the white person thinks of us in the global south. And actually looking from that perspective, you know, and looking at how this a few men bringing this like feminist queer, uh, like few men and masculine powers that is actually want to control us from down south, having this certain image that they don't want to change. Uh, actually, like br brings a lot of uh, correctness and, 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 and brings a lot of uh, uh, truth that must be heard and must be uh, realized. So uh, the Palestinians struggle against uh, colonial apartheid power of, uh, Israel, of Israel and the extended complicity of the EU uh, can be fought together with, the, with those such as our uh, friends here, Richard Falk and uh, Catherine and Reis and many others who are actually watching and listening and fighting together the complicity of the EU and, and in all level, whether it, it's political level or academic level, as Catherine have exposed clearly, or uh, diplomatic level or so on. Therefore, uh, I would like to end my note on uh, always the, the dream that Palestinians uh, would, uh, would love to have is uh, that they could actually leave um, they could actually live in, in, in uh, dignity, freedom, and justice as uh, forever. And that uh, Catherine would no longer have to leave 
uh, to have to live under uh, bombs as all the Palestinian and have to cry all the way while she's leaving our house in Gaza, going to Egypt, you know, while uh, knowing that she's the privileged one, that she could with her Canadian passport, Canadian passport leave our house while we while leaving us alone under the bomb. Because that is that is what actually is uh, what the EU is doing right now is leaving us alone under the bomb. So let's leave you know, no one behind. Thank you so much for everybody who have been organizing here today. And I hope uh, we, we continue with the discussion later. Thank you. Our next uh, commentator is Richard Falk, who is uh, Albert G. Milbank Professor of International Law and Practice Emeritus at Princeton University where he taught for several decades and who is also former visiting distinguished professor in global and international studies at the University of California at Santa Barbara. Uh, he's had a rather legendary career as a citizen pilgrim in his phrase, running from participation in high level delegations to North Vietnam and Iran in the 1960s and 1970s on through his more recent service as the United Nations Special Rapporteur for Human Rights in Occupied Palestine. He blogs frequently at Global Justice in the 21st Century, and his new book is Public Intellectual, The Life of a Citizen Pilgrim, in which he describes his lifelong struggle to transform the international order to support peace, justice, and environmental sustainability. Richard, thank you for being with us. Uh, I want to congratulate Catherine for uh, producing this wonderfully original and stimulating book that can be read in many different ways and for many different, or it's relevant to many different audiences in my view. Uh, and one of the things that it, uh, one of its uh, uh, most uh, remarkable achievements is to make inter studying international relations interesting uh, and readable. And it's, uh, it's the kind of, uh, the kind of text uh, that I think every uh, student of international relations should start off with, because it makes you think differently. And, and it expands what it expands the spectrum of relevance in ways that are uh, creative and progressive. Uh, it it uh, frees it, it pedagogically, you can think of it as a liberating text from the rigidities of the conventional discipline. And in that way, I think it's uh, both uh, me methodologically very imaginative and pedagogically very significant. And for that, uh, I mean, just aside from addressing uh, this uh, very uh, uh, imaginatively selected question to uh, investigate, because uh, it is uh, it it so beautifully uh, illustrates the central uh, thesis, which I take to be that uh, uh, diplomacy got the outcome of the two two thousand six election all wrong, and by getting it all wrong, it produced a chain of events. Uh, that are still uh, generating massive suffering and a, a great deal of uh, violence and uh, frustration. And it's, uh, it's an illustrative of uh, what is wrong with geopolitics, for one thing, and uh, for what, uh, how, how rigidly the protocols of diplomacy are enforced. And I think one thing that uh, it might be interesting to explore in our discussion is uh, the degree to which the EU 
felt uh, that it wasn't worth endangering its relationship with the U.S. in order to uh, get it right in Gaza. In other words, the uh, the priorities that uh, guided diplomacy at the highest levels uh, give uh, suggest that the most important thing for the EU is to uh, maintain the benevolent relationship with the U.S. And the U.S. was pressured into its position by Israel, and uh, it it was the, and the whole thing, uh, which I think uh, is implicit in in what you've written. It, Hamas was encouraged to enter the 2006 election, but they were encouraged for a sinister reason because the experts were sure they would lose. And this, if they lost, that would strengthen the whole argument of the legitimacy of supporting Abbas and the Palestinian Authority and delegitimizing Hamas. They uh, made the uh, tactical mistake, if one wants to put it that way, of winning. And when, once they won, uh, the only thing that could uh, save the, uh, uh, the diplomatic uh, rigidity uh, was uh, to put them in the terror, to keep them in the terrorist box, and uh, and I know I uh, from my own experience in meeting Hamas leaders while I was UN Special Rapporteur, uh, I can confirm uh, Catherine's impressions that they very much wanted to pursue a political path to achieve their goals. And they knew that if uh, they were kept in, the ter in, in this terrorist box, that it would lead to very destructive violence for, for, their pe for the Palestinian people and also for the Israelis. They, they had a, uh, I had a long conversation, particularly with uh, Michelle in uh, Doha, and he very much confirmed in a uh, setting that was very trustworthy and uh, with the emir of, of uh, Qatar. And uh, I found it very convincing what he uh, seemed to be saying something he really believed. And it, it really tracks very well uh, what Catherine uh, depicted in, in this uh, very outstanding book. Uh, and the, uh, so I think that we have to, uh, I wonder what, how you would have uh, constructed the argument if you had looked at why the U.S. Uh, sustained that position after encouraging. It was more the U.S. than the EU, that in, and particularly Condoleezza Rice, who was encouraging Hamas to say, play the political game and we will support you. That was definitely the message conveyed uh, in advance of the and And uh, it was part of the wider efforts of the Bush camp, Bush presidency to uh, promote their view of democracy in the region. She had made this well-known speech in Cairo and, uh, around this time as well. Uh, so I think it would be interesting in our discussion to uh, bring the U.S. Uh, into the picture uh, because uh, in one way, the timidity of the EU seems to me to be partly a consequence of its uh, deference 
which is a Cold War legacy. It's a Cold War legacy that, that Europe depended for security on the US uh, to defend it and to uphold a common ideology. And it hasn't, it, it hasn't liberated itself from that legacy. I think that's uh, part of what I would say is important. Uh, so I think it's interesting at the moment to notice that in the most trustworthy poll of uh, Palestinian public opinion after this recent cycle of violence in May, that there is a great uh, increase in support for Hamas and for armed struggle as a tactic of resistance. And, see, and there are all sorts of motivations uh, that Israel has pursued, uh, has, has exemplified in their policies toward Gaza. One of which is to have a combat zone where they can test their new weaponry, which is one of their big export industries. And they've used it as a experimental combat zone for not only weapons, but counterinsurgency tactics, and have turned that into a very uh, positive diplomatic tool and uh, export uh, earning industry. And the second thing is they want to show uh, Iran what would happen to them if they really confront, they use I mean, it's a very cruel policy, but they uh, use Gaza as a way of uh, what they call deterring uh, Iran. And uh, it, it's a, a, a kind of sacrificial logic. And it's, it's not actually a, a, a correct logic, but it, it's and very destructive. So that what let me end by saying that uh, this this is the kind of book that makes you think differently and freshly and raises the questions that are not normally and asked, much less answered. And so I congratulate again, Catherine, for opening so many doors for those of us that are puzzled by what's happening in the world. Thank you very much. Our final uh, commentator is Rhys McCauld, who has received his PhD uh, from Wilfrid Laurier University in Ottawa, Canada, and who is currently a lecturer in politics at the University of Glasgow. His research focuses on violence, uh, security, and policing with empirical sites in Palestine and Israel, and also in India, particularly the, the city of Mumbai. And this dual focus has resulted in papers such as Militarizing Mumbai, The Politics of Response, and Learning from Israel. He is currently working on the concept of policing and security laboratories in understanding how certain policy experiences are constituted as exemplary cases or models that then circulate from one country to another. Reese, thank you very much for being here. Thanks so much. So yeah, first of all, I'd just like to thank the ISRF for inviting me to be part of this discussion on Catherine's book today, uh, and to Chris, of course, for moderating. Um, so just to start, Catherine, I found your book incredibly insightful and challenging in an, a variety of different ways. Um, I won't be able to sort of do them all any real justice in these few minutes today, so in my remarks, I'll just kind of focus on a few things that stood out for me as particularly notable. So the first, I think, is the impressive sort of your imperative to write and think against kind of the normal, the taking for granted, the order of things. Here, the structure of the book as a montage and series of juxtapositions is particularly key. As you write on page four, quote, 
This book relies on a montage to tell a different story, end of quote. Quoting Pearson and Shanks, you note that, quote, montage is the cutting and reassembling of fragments of meanings, images, things, quotations, borrowings to create new juxtapositions, end of quote. For me, this approach does a particularly brilliant job, both of connecting things that we might otherwise seem to have little in common. But also, and just as crucially, the structure works to disturb and make peculiar that which is routinely sort of staged as normal, natural, or regular. And I think it's worth mentioning that your focus on trying to tell different stories about the international, the global, and the colonial through fragments is in good company with a range of other scholars. For instance, Partha Chatterjee's The Nation and Its Fragments is situated as a counter to the, as a counter to the quote, arrogant, intolerant, self-aggrandizing rational subject of modernity by resurrecting the virtues of the fragmentary. Chatterjee claims the fragmentary is a specific way to free the previously colonized imagination. And like you, Catherine, makes no apologies for what such an approach might miss out. He notes that, quote, to make a claim on behalf of the fragment is also to produce a discourse that is itself fragmentary. It is redundant to make apologies for this, end of quote. Similarly, in Friction, uh, anthropologist Anna Singh similarly endorses the virtue of the fragmentary perspective for telling different kinds of stories about global connection. She notes that, quote, global connections are made in fragments. Some fragments are able to make themselves look whole. Honoring the fragment means acknowledging this power, but not accepting it as a done deal, end of quote. So I wanna to suggest today that your book furthers this fragmentary analysis, carried out as a montage of juxtaposed personal experiences, photos, and your own, of your, and your own pieces of your own personal inner dialogue, and interviews with a range of actors, some of whom are more sort of inspiring, insightful, and compelling than others. You show how imperial and colonial power works. But in doing so, you also lay bare the questionable assumptions, the non-decisions, the laziness, the self-indulgence of EU policy that keeps the ongoing domination of Palestine in place. Yet you also refuse to accept them, their ideologies, forms of reasoning, assumptions, and very claim to rationality as a done deal. Your playful personal and transgressive style, inspired by drag performance, unsettles and unstitches the facade of imperial power, showing its arrogance, but also signaling to its emptiness and potential fragility uh, when it's subject to any kinds of interrogation. Indeed, your critiques of structures of power and policy go beyond simple denunciation. They work through juxtaposition, showing how the various parts of the machinery of empire don't always add up. Here, your vignettes of officials outing themselves were particularly powerful. In relation to the persecution of Bedouins by Israel, you quote an EU official who states, quote, can't exactly say what's being done, but there are concrete things being done on the ground. We'll have to wait and see what work, what will work, and see what will happen in the council, end of quote. A second aspect of the book that I found particularly brilliant is how it grapples with the conditionality at the heart of Europe's relationship with Palestine broadly and Hamas in particular. You do so in a way that resists the idea that this relation is the outcome of some recent or unforeseen failure, whether in the form of preconditions of negotiation or evoking ties to so-called terrorism, Islamism, or extremism. You definitely, definitely show how conditionality is the centerpiece of these relationships. Here you write that the EU remain, quote, remains attached to the fantasy itself. It only hears its own discourse of adjudication of the other. It misses on the it thus misses on the political arguments for resistance in front of it, end of quote. Yet here too, you show how utterly farcical this reasoning is when examined up close. In a section aptly entitled, quote, can you even hear yourself? You quote an EU official responding to inquiries about their approach to the national unity government formed between Fatah and Hamas as follows, quote, first, the Palestinians need to get their act together and then they need to negotiate with Israel. Our only reservation is that, is that we need the Palestinians to get their act together in a way that enables a negotiation with Israel rather than one which closes it off, end of quote. After which you appropriately ask, quote, what are you even talking about? 
So to wrap up my comments today, I just want to thank you for giving us a book, giving this, this book, written in a way that is incisively and beautifully disrupts the imprisoning rituals of imperial diplomacy. But the book also disrupts the imprisoning conventions of academic knowledge production and academic life more broadly. Your refusal to abide by them is an inspiration to all of us for thinking about how the structure and style of storytelling changes the story itself. I hope that you're able to continue to find ways to develop the style and critical disposition in your future work. Catherine, you get a, a word at this point in response to whatever you have heard. And then I would also urge uh, the audience to submit questions to the Q&A, which we are going to get to ASAP. Uh, thanks you all again, Catherine, to you. Great. Well, first of all, I mean, thank you so much. I just enjoyed listening um, to, to those responses. Um, was really moved um, that you all appreciated the form of the book. And I must admit, um, and I'm not, you know, when I reread the book myself, I was actually, I actually really enjoyed reading it. Um, you know, <laughs> um, so, and I, you know, I, I wasn't necessarily expecting to, I read it and I, I, I did enjoy reading it my, myself these past days, um, as Madge said, as a novel. And thank you, you know, the biggest compliment, right, that written as, as, as a Palestinian. And I think maybe this touches on this desire to really account for those details, really account for those stories of my experience being there, um, staying with Majid and his family uh, for three months, uh, being there uh, during a, a war. And as Majid uh, said, one of the saddest moments of my life was of course, um, you know, receiving a, a phone call from the UN uh, school for the blind that they were uh, organizing an emergency convoy that allowed those that held a non-palestinian passport to leave um to leave palestine at that time and enter into egypt um, and i talk about this experience in the book um so you know i think as as we said it's it's sort of drawing on these um different fragments um, and and linking them together in a particular way, I think that allows me to kind of talk about uh, an affective quality um, to these experiences, which which goes so often unreported, is, as we said, in, in this sort of uh, arrogance of modernity that attempts to um, condition the way in which we interpret events um, and experiences. Um, so that we essentially miss a lot of these really important uh, relationalities um, and community building opportunities. Um, and of course, a lot of what the book tries to do, and, and you know, uh, I, I, I laughed at my own words when Reese read them back to me in his presentation, that, that tries to sort of tackle the, the well-oiled machine that Empire tries to present itself, right? And, and you know, Richard pointed to some really important uh, points of interrogation um, in his response, which you know, almost when you're you're hearing these these responses from EU bureaucrats, you almost can't believe you that this is how an, as such an important decision as Hamas coming to power in 2006. You know, as Richard said, was you know supported by diplomats at the time, supported by bureaucrats. The participation of Hamas in the elections was actually held to improve the, the, the democratic nature of the politics. Um, uh, and, and then as we said, the farce, farcical way in which is responded to, right? So, so Richard said, you know, um, the position of, of the US and Israel. So really, you know, I was told that after, almost immediately after the elections, uh, um, Israeli and uh, or US diplomats under pressure from a Israeli foreign uh, minister um, are calling up European leaders saying, you know what you have to do, right? It's like a TV show, calling them up and saying, you know, the election's gonna be in five, or the, you know, the decision of the European Union on whether to impose the conditions is gonna come in five days, you know what you have to do. You know, phone calls of this nature. And, you know, I, I've made this point in the book that, you know, the European Union loves to hold discussions on human rights, on Palestine, and has endless conferences and workshops. And yet at a moment when it was so important to draw this decision, the EU, within five days, had basically decided they were going to sanction Hamas, right? It took them no kind time to come up with the decision. Um, so it, it kind of shows, I think, as, as was pointed to, I think, by all of the, the respondents, essentially the, the sort of the farcical performance of this. And it really tries to sort of interrogate um, what, what tries to perform as a well-oiled machine 
uh, but 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 really, um, there are so many um, inconsistencies uh, to point out, which I hope that I did in my book. Um, so again, thank you so much. Um, and really, there's so many more things I would love to say to all of those great comments. Um, I think we should open it up to questions. I think as, as I was sort of instructed to keep this part of the presentation short. And I think last time, and anyone can really answer the questions that are in the chat as we are all quoting. Yeah, I'm Catherine, I'm gonna read them to you. So you don't okay. have to you don't have to think, and that's true for the, all the panelists and, and also read the chat box. I'll, I'll just do that part. Uh, there was one question in the Q&A that I just wanted to, respond to myself, which has to do with the price of the book, which is very high. Um, I This is a great series. I mean, Reese was pointing out the, how the series that you're in called Interventions has these quite unusual titles. So I think it's really worth supporting the series as well as this individual book. But commercial academic publishing, we have to uh, really do something about this. And not buying Catherine's book is not the way to show our opposition to the commercial station I got publishing, but it's something that collectively I would really like us to um, have a think about. And Catherine, we can work on this side on a program for getting your book into wider distribution than um, for folks that can't pay this cover price, which is pretty crazy. Um, okay, that said, here's a question from Jenny uh, to Catherine or others. Um, what do you think of the tendency of using the adjective Western to qualify the word democracy. Lots of news reports lately, or at least in the English speaking world, refer to Western democracies. What's that about? It's the first one. That's for anybody. I mean, I, I think almost in the book, I, I kind of make fun of almost this idea a bit, right? That Europe likes to see itself as having a kind of monopoly over the idea of democracy. Um, and there's sort of a, a European leader who says, oh, you know, they, they, they don't get it like we do. They only have theocracy. Um, and I, I think I ridicule it precisely by, by showing um, how when at a, at a moment when it was so important for the European Union to essentially defend the result of a democratic election, they failed miserably, right? Um, and this is without without question. And they themselves also recognize this, right? So I think that there are big questions um, to pose as, as you know, good literature has done about European Union seeing itself as, you know, promoting democracy in the region and also asking ourselves is, you know, what does that performance actually do also? Um, I don't know if any... Uh, could I just add a, a word or two? I think uh, the, the phrase Western democracy uh, is, a, uh, is intended to import the uh, capitalism into the notion of constitutionalism. So that uh, when you say Western democracy, you mean the, the way the, the political system that won the Cold War. And, and, and it won the Cold War by a combination of the market and the state. And, and I think that's the, it's a kind of coded uh, phrasing that was uh, uh, used sometimes in the formula market-oriented constitutionalism. Uh, but I think the essence of Western democracy is one that uh, insists on the uh, inclusion of a market economy. Thank you. Okay, we have three more questions. I'll, I'll just read them one at a time. Um, first from anonymous attendee is, whatever they say in public, surely UK diplomats are talking behind the scenes with Hamas, just as they did with the IRA during the troubles. Is that correct? Yeah, so I talk about this sort of secret diplomacy, like secret diplomacy in the book, and I kind of make two particular points on it. I mean, one is, you know, in secret, a lot of European Union leaders and British um, as well use that opportunity to say to Hamas leaders, we're really sorry 
right? We disagree with our, with our government's position towards you. We don't think that the boycotts and sanction are correct. I imagine, you know, and they, they met quite a lot, right? So it was quite common for sort of unofficial leaders to come and meet with Hamas. And I said, well, all, this is perhaps cathartic and uh, perhaps even unpleasurable. Um, it allows the diplomat, the British diplomat, to, to perform this idea that it, it's it's doing good, um, which is, is, you know, does does that particular role. But the, the performativity of the secret meeting continues to perform this idea that it is Hamas who needs to be kept uh, uh, secretive, um, that the meeting itself is illegitimate, um, that it needs to be kept behind closed doors, um, which to continues to perform this idea um, that Hamas are, are illegitimate and thus require um, secrecy. Um, and that in itself constrains, I think, the kinds of conversations that can be had, right? And so when they come to meet, it's all about trying to get Hamas to perform by particular conditions in order to be recognized by the British government, by the European Union government, and does actually very little for you know, the, the Palestinian cause more, more greatly, right? So it's all about trying to give Hamas particular conditions to overcome, which the EU itself set, right? So those meetings are all about trying to get Hamas to conform to a particular um, idea of legitimacy to be allowed out of the closet, as it were, so. I don't know if Matt, if, Imagine you, I thought you were gonna say something or if anyone wants to say anything. I am gonna cut back to the questions because we have several more. Um, this is from Erica Reef. Uh, I see no winning a battle with Israel and military engagement just gives Israel an excuse to destroy the lives of more Palestinians. How do the panelists feel about this idea that diplomacy is non-existent and so violence is the only option, especially since prior to this last genocide, the public view was finally being made aware of the ongoing evictions of Palestinians in desirable neighborhoods uh, in Jerusalem, I think that means. So question about violence and diplomacy, if diplomacy is kind of fake, but violence is, can't be <laughs> victorious. I mean, I, I think one thing that's an essential to, to, to hold on to, and I think, you know, Richard mentioned this at the end of his, his intervention, is how much imperial economies rely on the production of, of violence and war, right? It, 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 so there is a secret document that I talk about in the book, but in fact, it doesn't, you know, it's not, it doesn't unveil that much because almost that we all know this, right? And it, 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 and it, it, it it basically says that it's very good for the uh, for Israel that Hamas was elected into power into Gaza, and actually Israeli academics um, and like it's a really long story, but um, so you know supported Hamas in the 80s to gain power and control of uh, the Islamic University there. It's not a you know it it. Israel allowed Hamas to flourish in many in many regards, right? It did nothing to try to squash the growth of the movement. The book doesn't deal with that history. It's been written about by others. Um, and I think there are important questions to ask in terms of anti-colonial resistance, why that was, and what, what has to happen um, in order to think, you know, importantly about which kind of actors need to take charge of anti-colonial resistance right now. Um, but coming back to the question, so, um, it, you know, it was very beneficial for, it has been extremely beneficial for Israel that Hamas came into power. And one of the reasons that was is because it allowed it to, to basically, you know, delegitimize uh, the Palestinian cause, Palestinian governance structures, and to continue to wage, wage violence um, against uh, Palestinians, right? So it, it basically gave it that ability um, to, to defend through this discourse of terrorism, it's right to use violence. Um, and th this is right, a lot of imperial economies function on this, on, on, in this way, right? Um, I don't know if Reese, you wanted to add anything? Yeah, I mean, I think that covers it well. I think that, I mean, for me, the important point to note is that it's always possible to show the particular ways that certain particular circumstances like the rise of Hamas enables more Israeli aggression, for example, and that's all true. And we can see that plainly in your book and, and more broadly. But I think it's important to recognize that had it not been from Hamas, there would have always been 
a way in which that violence would have been carried out and exercised and the particular contingencies of how it has been brought to bear under these circumstances. They're not irrelevant and they're not irrelevant for the people's lives they affect, but in some structural sense, I mean, following people like Patrick Wolf, for example, we're looking at a structure, not an event. We're looking at a system of domination that would always find a sort of a political rationalization to meet out more violence and find a way to profit from that. Um, and I just think, yeah, it's important to, I mean, as Richard sort of noted, the elephant in the room is, is the United States. And even the, the profitability of this violent hinges on, on them pumping billions of dollars into Israel. So like even the, eco the economic rationality of it isn't so much that it's profitable as much as it is that they have this expendable resource that they can bring to bear. So I think it's, it's important to recognize the, the particularities and the, yeah, the, the, the storyline that you tell, but it's also important to sort of zoom out a little bit and, and not lose sight of that broader perspective. And, and yeah, also you. just, oh, go ahead. No, also, also it's important to what uh, to go with what, what Katrina said, you know, to the rise of Hamas and how this have happens. You know, I always, my father was one of a uh, leader of the first Intifada, like um, United Fronts, and and he was the one of the PFL in the PFLP. And in the end of the day, at that time, he was telling me, even everybody was like Gaza. It was for red, red. It means leftist. So imagine how this kind of shift have actually happened from the 70s and 80s until the rise of Hamas. And he also speaks about how Israel actually have don't want any rational and any one that goes to the faction of right. That is, I mean, right by the correct Palestinian that, uh, that looks rational, that can call for one state, for example, that can call for equality. So they wanted to kill the PFLB. And they wanted to kill any leftist like ideas in any in any forum. So that's why they actually would did everything possible to to enjoy the PFLB to actually kill like uh, make it, it brings the many of the leader of the PFLB until today. You know, like you can look at the PFLB. Like I'm just speaking about the other part, like not kind of looking of uh, of how they. Actually, the PFLB is older uh, leaders in prison. So everybody is like, they are one of the most targeted actually uh, parties in Palestine. And that actually has a reason, it has a rationale. And this rationale is, is mentioned in both Rice and Catherine uh, uh, like uh, explanation, but that doesn't actually uh, bring out the nature of Israel, Israel nature is colonial nature and it's very violence, extreme violence nature, whether it is in 19, uh, before 1948 when it was Zionist uh, groups and or, or after, you know, they are, they want to build any structure that allow them to be as legitimate and recognized as possible and also part of this, the Western, civil, civil, Western democratic civilization, which is also the essence of actually, again, intervention uh, to just go back to what uh, Richards have said about, yeah, the essence of Western um, democracy that can fit the Eastern places and our natures and how it's a long question. I would say it's where, uh, but it's also a question of uh, intervention and, and how they are, uh, and it's very clear in our revolution. So I'm sorry, I went to two questions, but I'm, uh, that doesn't actually make anything legitimate, and it does goes again to the fact that Palestinians have a legitimate uh, space, a party that they voted for, and they should this party should take legitimacy and to uh, speak in behalf of the Palestinian, if they like it or don't like it. If we, as the one who oppose Hamas, like it or doesn't like it. Hamas is there to uh, stay and will stay. That's how it will. Thank you very much. Um, we have four more questions. So I think we should just assume we're gonna take our full 10 minutes to the half hour. And um, I'm, I will read these two at a time um, so that we can take a shot at all four of them. Um, first is uh, Tony Sharat with the new coalition government. <laughs> Do you know this person? He's my brother. <laughs> <laughs> um, with the new coalition government in Israel, do you think they will give Hamas more of a voice? Brother is very succinct. And then they're uh, from an anonymous attendee. 
Hi, this was absolutely brilliant. Thank you for, um, and looking forward to reading the book too. And my question has more to do with your work than with the book itself, um, which is, do you feel that your work might be threatened, especially since it also talks of your personal experience within the current UK academic climate? How do you see this or plan to challenge it? The UK academic climate, I think is the it there. Okay, so let's do those two, and then there are two more after that. Okay, both difficult questions, um, to which I don't know if I can offer a um, full response. I mean, to to Tony, um, I mean, I think it it just coming back to the the conversation before that a lot of these things are a sort of around around st structure, right? And I I think um, you know it that Hamas like holds a particular sort of importance for the way that Israel tries to frame its response to um, uh, Palestinian um, shifts in the Palestinian sort of political landscape. Um, so I, 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 I don't think so, right? And, and often I don't think that it's actually sort of its priority right now. Like what we see right now on the ground is that um, mass arrests of Israeli, uh, sort of, of Palestinians um, taking place and we see sort of the support of the PA in attempting to go after any people that are going to try to, to protest against the Palestinian Authority, even though they decided not to hold the election. So actually, I mean, Tony, this is a great sort of opening to encourage us all to really, really, really pay attention to what's going on right now, right? And I think that, you know, this idea of needing a kind of cross-community abolition practice against mass arrests is extremely important. So, you know, for everyone to keep their eyes um, on what's going on, right? Um, the second question was, uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of, you know, me talking in the book from a personal perspective, if this puts me at risk, um, it's, you know, I, it seems that there is actually sort of a growing interest in sort of more creative approaches to international relations, international politics. I think often it takes time, you know, you, you push the boundaries and then sometimes these things sort of become more normal and then you're able to, to continue with your work. So I, I, I think actually there, there is a growing space for this kind of work and we just need to continue sort of making, making space for it and, and taking space up uh, through, through storytelling. Um, and of course, right, there are um, uh, really long histories um, and uh, important places where storytelling remains really important, right? And learning from those other uh, cultures and spaces where storytelling has that role, um, I think remains an important, you know, place for international relations academics um, and other academics and other disciplines uh, to learn, right? Not from a place from arrogance, but from learning. Thank you for those questions. Yeah, let me get these next two in, and then if any of you want to cycle back to any of the previous questions, you're welcome to do that. We have another six minutes anyway. From Gil Nata, what's your take on the participation of Palestinians in the new extreme right-wing Israeli government? And then from Craig Jones, uh, is anybody able to speak to the role of nonviolent resistance in relation to Hamas and Gaza? In the Great March of Return, nonviolent protest was an important component of articulating an anti-siege, anti-occupation position in Palestine, of course not the first, one that was both supported and challenged by Hamas. I'm asking this not to condemn violent resistance, but for us to think seriously about the important role that nonviolence plays in Hamas politics, uh, could this help us reimagine Hamas? Those are hard. <laughs> Good luck, you all. Um, so again, thank you very much for what are two really important questions. Um, I think I have more to say about the second one that, that Craig asked about, you know, looking at them initially together. I mean, as an out, as an outsider, um, I think that I always sort of try to, to, to say that 
you know, Palestinians in different parts of all of occupied and colonized Palestine have been trying to strategize against power in numerous and different and shifting ways um, since it, it was colonized, right? And since the land was given away and since the genocide, right? And that in each part of Palestine, <laughs> including the diaspora, requires a different kind of, of politics um, and in which that I won't understand fully because I, you know, I, I don't suffer from this in the same way. Um, and of course, each part requires a different kind of strategizing. Now, I know that part of the joint list decided to, um, you know, support parts of the Knesset, or they were part of the Knesset, and support part of the Knesset in the last elections before Netanyahu. Um, so not this round of elections, the elections prior to that. Um, they took a gamble, some parts of the joint list, to support um, uh, parts of the government um, and it and it seriously backfired, right? Um, and this, uh, and you know, like you you like maybe you say you, you shouldn't be surprised. How are you going to support the government, uh, the Knesset, the Israeli government, um, uh, in in this case? Um, but they took a gamble. I imagine some of them for perhaps personal power reasons, but a lot of them to try to create as much space as possible for Palestinians to have, you know, viable life in parts of of, of Israel, right? Um, uh, and and then now in the next round of elections, the, the voter turnout amongst uh, Palestinians was significantly low um, in Israel uh, because of that disappointment. So coming to Craig's uh, question, thanks Craig, thanks for coming. Um, I think this is a really interesting question um, in terms of you know, the use of, of non of nonviolence and the way that we, in which we understand Hamas. Now, you know, we know that when Hamas uh, did come to power, it, it ran under an electoral platform change and reform um, to try to disassociate itself from the armed wing, right? Um, and of course, it adopts many strategies um, that are non-violent, right? Which, which shouldn't be surprising because it is a political movement and it has certain strategies which use um, violence in particular ways. And then it has strategies such as uh, diplomacy, um, uh, uh, that it has also used in terms of trying um, to to reach out uh, to actors and and these are you know tactics and strategies that the movement I imagine discusses uh, among itself after 30 years of resistance and that it it uh, discusses with other resistance movements um, in order to try to come up um, with the best strategies to uh, resist against um, the the colonial government uh, the, sorry the colonial regime. Um, and I think you're right that this 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 should open doors to how we we view Hamas. Uh, did anyone you want to say anything about the uh, participation in the new coalition government? The word Palestinians was in quotation marks in the in the question, Gil Nada's question. Sorry, did I did I? Uh, you mean? In the uh, I'm not sure this, Catherine, I just, can I ask? Are you saying something? Can I answer this if possible? Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah I think it's um I hope my internet is good. I is it can you hear me? Oh perfect. So um it's very few Palestinians who are actually part of this. Yeah, so it's very important to understand that this is not the majority. The majority of the Palestinians in the 48s have actually called for the boycotting of the Knesset. So as uh, Catherine have said, there are different strategies. The same what we've seen with Hamas, they're trying everything to actually release the people. They've tried everything, they try to join the election, they try to say that we actually in other forum that we uh, recognize the 67 land, you know, even though they would not, but it's in the end of the day, They've tried everything. It's out of the being that extreme, extremely vulnerable, and also being a leader of that kind of a, a strong, like a very difficult anti-colonial struggle, and being the only one who's actually organized in the streets, the one that has uh, the power to tell people go out, go in, have the institutions, have everything, allow you to actually have strong uh, responsibility. I myself, as a Palestinian who are actually you know, the opposition of Hamas, I would say still, I, 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 I cannot re re realize still and, and in my head how smart and how, uh, how are they trying their best to actually show themselves. 
you know, and until that they are actually existing as a legitimate power and as the representative of the, their people, you know. And I would, uh, that goes to Craig, like a uh, question regarding the Great Return March, you know. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a very difficult question, Yanni. It's this is what Yanni you know, Hamas is trying their best. Uh, they're trying to imagine any any other ways. Actually, if you look at Hamas during the last, uh, I would say, ten to 12, 12 years, they have uh, reduced a huge amount of uh, like unorganized resistance, grouping of. Uh, they have have a huge control. You know, people in Gaza have actually for a while have. Uh, claim that they, they started calling them as collaborator with Israel because they don't send uh, rockets to Israel. They stopped resistance at the, at the borders, which is unorganized. They stopped extreme group that pay, paid some time by Israel themselves, you know, to, pay, to, to throw rockets in Israel, to, to tell that in the end of the day that there are rockets, yeah, we can respond. But Israel doesn't need Hamas to actually create any violent structure uh, res uh, response of bombardments, of attack, of aggressions every day in our lives, you know? The same goes, I would connect it to the line of the new government, you know? what? I, I mean, the new government have not done anything. My The papers of my mom, for example, that has to be travel and my, pa my parents, is, is blocked at the checkpoints for the last two months because the posts are not allowed to go out of Gaza for the last two months. I don't know what this is called in English, but the tomatoes have the green things above it, you know? And this green thing, they didn't allow tomatoes to go out of Gaza recently. That has this, they, that the borders, that the, the, the Israelis want, the tomatoes became a, a threat to the Israeli security with this government. This Israeli, like the Israel itself is a racist regime and, and anybody contribute whether they are Palestinian even to this kind of uh, very much, um, uh, very much racist Zionist ideology. All of them are under this umbrella. And this umbrella, Yani, is an, uh, it's a racist umbrella. It's a Zionist racist umbrella that has a very rooted structure in colonial, uh, ethnic cleansing, uh, extreme oppression uh, that we see in every place in Palestine, you know? So that changing a government, changing a politician, changing doesn't change anything because anyway, I mean, the ethnic, the demolition of Silwan is still going on. The, uh, the, demolition, the demolition of Sheikh Zarrah and the ethnic cleansing is still going on. They are preventing any political movement to take place. You know, they're killing any individual and censoring and silencing and collaborating with any social media that allow any individual to speak. So that's all an overall from an internal and external and wider, broader uh, resistance. And they're trying to kill any resistance. And, and I don't, uh, any, there, there, is a, there is a way to imagine a future, but the futures would come as I would say to, I, I always, and I continue saying in this lectures, and I said it to Catherine about Hamas must be here. That's full stop. Hamas must take a place because Fatih is not taking any place. You know, the only one that has most of the place is Hamas, you know, at the moment in all of Palestine, because they give dignity. Negotiation doesn't give dignity to all the last year. They didn't give dignity to Palestinians. So Palestinians see Hamas as the only legitimate place. Thank you. Thank you, we are out of even our second part of the time. <laughs> so I'm going to bring this to a close. Catherine, you have one last sentence that you want to utter? to send us off with. Besides, I, I could just say buy Catherine's book. Oh. Any, any price for Catherine's book. Um, otherwise, I will just thank the panel for a really wonderful combination of comments and thank the audience for hanging in there and also for a fabulous set of questions. Thank you for joining us. For ISRF updates and information about future events, please sign up to our mailing list at www.isrf.org forward slash mailing list. See you again soon. Goodbye.